This is a My Two Cents video from Nikki Batgirl D'Angelo, a Star Citizen Addicts Anonymous production. In this week's video, I discuss all the things that are making me happy about Star Citizen once more. Hello everyone and welcome back to My Two Cents. I am trying to get back into these videos, but even more so, I've been trying to get back into the game. Star Citizen has been the love of my life as far as video games go, going all the way back to 2013 when I first stepped inside my hangar. That first sit down in my Aurora was absolutely one of the best moments that I had in the game, and it sounds weird to say that, and it's because I didn't know what to expect. And ever since then, I've actually just grown my understanding, my belief of what the game was going to be. Even cultivated relationships with Chris and Sandy and Ben and Chris Smith and so many other people. David Haddock. So many other people. And I, I have been a a quiet supporter, a vocal supporter, a salty supporter of the game for a very long time. But if you ask me in person, should I play the game, I was always very cautious about it because it's not a game, right? It's just not. It's kind of a universe that they're building and the game is being sprinkled in it little by little over time. Kind of the way that a river will deposit sediment in its estuaries. I, I don't even know what I'm saying at that point, but it's, it's something that's been taking a very long time to come together. Which led me to have a little bit of, I guess I could say it's not regret, or I guess it was a, it wasn't a loss of belief. It was just a, really? That's what we're doing at this point? this point in our development of the game, we're going to be removing something, not adding something. And I'm talking about the removal of Delamar in the latest patch. Yeah, I'm being a little bit solemn about it. I didn't really like Delamar. I went there for teaches. I like to do it on my alt account. It's tough, right? It's really tough because you always expect the game to go forward and not back. But I think that's where we have to actually put a dividing line. And we have to start defining what going back and going forward is. Removing a place that people just weren't interacting with or adding actual fun events in the game that are going to get your alliance, your org together for the first time in a long time to do something together. That's a great addition. And that's exactly what the latest update has done to Star Citizen. And 3.12.1, I think that's where we're at. I, I'd have to say it's been my favorite time in the game over the last two days. Absolutely my favorite time in the game. And it, it's a combination of everything that's already there. All the hard work that CIG has done. And all of the new work that they just added into it. And I think that the Xenar threat, although not perfect, I think that it's added certain element to the game to actually bring people together and do things, even though it's a little weak at times, a little tedious at times, it's still very fun. So I've been looking at 2021 as a whole, and I've tried to do this video quite a number of times. I've shot it different ways, I've tried to shoot it around the different things I like to do in the game, but it always comes back to this, and it's just those jaw-dropping scenes right there in front of us. Just, it's not just about the ships, about what you could do in the game. It's about the whole part. It's about the whole thing. It's unimaginable to think, at my age, 
that when I started gaming on computers way back when I had my Commodore 64, and everything was this 8-bit textures on the screen, or 8-bit coding and 16-color, 4-color, 8-color textures on the screen, that we would have come this far, especially from a man that was coding games back then. And yet here we are in a very, well, somewhat believable, not highly believable, but somewhat believable universe that they're putting together. And it's just absolutely amazing. And I know there's going to be another one of those gushing videos, and not really. There'll be a little bit of salt in it, too, I promise you. But overall, I'm very happy. Now, I do have a relationship with Chris and Sandy, so there are times that I hold my tongue and I'm not going to do it this time. Because there's so many things that are right with this game, but still the same things that are wrong. And I think one of the biggest things that's wrong with this game, it's not the glitching person that we just looked at over there in the lobby. It's not the 30 Ks that happen. It's that building this universe that takes me 20 minutes to get to my ship and take off is unrealistic for most people. And, you know, it's... Those of us that are addicted to gaming and game for three, four hours a night aren't going to see anything wrong with taking 20 minutes to get to a ship to take off and then get to your mission and take another five to seven minutes to get to your mission. Hell, it's almost as bad as getting into DCS and having to plan out your whole attack and taking hours and hours to do so. But at the end of the day, it's still a wow. And and I'm I'm looking at it from the perspective of I've invested a lot of money in this game, I've invested a lot of time in this game, and I've invested a lot of my soul into reporting on this game. And there was a long time there, between 2017 and 2019, when I just started to lose heart. And that's when CIG started changing from small company and taking care of all the people that were following them and were pimping them out to turning into corporate views and doing the corporate messaging and pretty much leaving those of us that were really pimping them out for so long behind. And we kind of hope that these companies are going to remember who got them there. And even though I'm friends with them, I, I feel like sometimes they forget about us, the people that are actually the ones that were there in the beginning and the ones that were pushing hard for them. But the one thing they don't forget about is the vision. And I know that it seems like Chris gets off target occasionally. I know that it seems like things take way too long occasionally, all the time. But it's good to see a patch that starts to bring things together. And I think two was a miserable set of patches. But the threes? They've had their times, you know, if you can think about how many 30Ks that we've had. I wish there was like a metric we could have of how many tons of cargo and dollars worth of cargo were lost because of 30Ks. I bet you it would be in the trillions by this point. But to have something that brings people back together again, that really does tie in the diversity of the ships that are in the game already, I'm all for so 2021, what's ahead of us? And it's going to be more things like this, more events like the Xeno threat. And in each patch, there's going to be a patch-centric event. And those are going to be the events that get us into the game. I'm hoping that by the time we get to 314, 315, that event is going to center around opening up Orison and Alasar, and probably, and I say Alasar, it's already there, but I, I, even though I asked Chris face-to-face, -face, is it going to go away? And he said, no, I still don't believe them. I think Alasar is going to take on the look and feel of the newer space stations. There's no way they can keep that pile of junk floating around <laughs> Crusader after we have beautiful stations like the ones in MICL1, like the ones over in Arc L2. Oh my god, the stations are just amazing now. And I can't see them 
I can't see them keeping in something like Alisar. And my, my guess is there's going to be a better looking Alisar in the future. But still, this year, I, I, I bit my tongue really hard because it was way back in October when I talked to Chris and we started talking about the, the building out of star systems. And it, it's not that I get a lot of time to talk to him. I can tell you that 5% of the time that I'm talking to him, we might mention Star Citizen and 1% of the time that we talk about it, I get information. But when I do get information, it's usually reading between the lines and I've been right many times about it. But I haven't been able to go to anybody because I will not ruin that relationship that I have with Chris and Sandy by leaking information that I may or may not have, that I may have just come up with on my own just from conversation. But when he started talking about building out the planetary systems, and we saw him, them talking about it on some of the Star Citizen lives and inside Star Citizen, and then I talked to Chris about it, I kind of had an idea that they were going to be moving development to a third party. And the reason why I started thinking about that was because he said, yeah, we, we, we need to build the tools. We're building the tools. And that's what we've been doing lately because, you know, I go and I talk to people and I say, why isn't it going so fast? And they'd say, well, because of this, 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 and that. And they said, well, then we need to implement something that makes it go faster and better and still maintains the, the, the standard that we set. So they made tools. Tools that made it easy to paint out planets fast. Like the planets would be procedurally generated and then an artist could sit down with the planet and input things like a strategy game, put them down on the ground and the assets that belong with them like uh, underground tubes and power and networking and all this other stuff would just auto connect as they were placing down pieces and then they would just have to work on the art to make them flow together, but in most cases they just would. And these are all the words that are coming into my head and I'm going, wait, this is an information dump and it's information overload. So by the time I, I ended the conversation and thought about it, it was like a day later and I talked to one of my friends on our Discord server, the Enablers Discord server, and I didn't give away anything. I just was like, you know, we, we talked about planetary development. I said, it's just going to take forever to to build these out unless they come up with some kind of a system. And then it hit me that they were probably doing this to outsource it because it didn't seem like after everything was done that it would be too hard for another company's artist to actually paint out the planets while CIG hired the people necessary to do the parts of the game that really need to be controlled by them, which are... And, and it's so succinct. It's just very, very, very succinct. Gameplay and technology. Those are important. And gameplay implements everything from the places that you have to go to, to the ships that you're going to fly, to the things that you're going to do. So that's important. And the networking technology to make it all come together. So CIG going with Turbulent actually lets them have more seats in their buildings for the people that are working on the technical side of it, the gameplay development side of it. And I believe that that's going to start making the game progress, chug along a little bit faster. And to support that, when you look at the roadmap, the roadmap now shows things that I didn't expect to be coming out in 2021, nine years after I got into the game. Oh my Lord, I must be insane to say this, but I didn't expect it so soon. But we're going to get physicalized inventory, iCash, and we're going to get, at some point, a, a early version, a rusty version of server mission. And folks, from there, it's just nothing but amazingness after that. Now, for those people that are looking for ships, I know people are still waiting on their whole C. I think it's going to come. They're working on the whole A and the whole B, which have some of the technology in them that they have to implement in order to get to the whole C. I know people like myself are waiting on the Polaris, but actually I'd like to get my Perseus before the Polaris. But now that we have the Xeno event, I want my Polaris. And we're still missing some of the alien ships, which I think this year is going to be an alien year. 
We're going to get Xi'an transport. We're going to get Xi'an medium fighter or bomber or whatever it is. And hopefully, hopefully, hopefully we get another pass, something that actually makes the Vandal's scythe and glaive actually useful for those people that spent oodles and oodles and oodles and oodles of cash on those. Oh, and the Banu defender. But, you know, you could beg for your ships all day long without gameplay, without places to go. It, ships just don't, they don't matter. So today I woke up early and spent two hours in the game, flew around in my freelancer MIS, thought I was recording and I wasn't. I went through a bunch of missions to just to get some more cash. Started the day at 285, got quickly up to 314 by doing a couple of bounty hunter missions. And I took the MIS because I thought it would be a good ship for Xenothreat. Mind you, I didn't look further along my list of ships, or early enough in my list of ships, to know that I had a Vanguard, which is absolutely the best ship for the Xenothreat missions because it's built like a brick poop house. But I got in the game, I, I, I did my missions, I flew around, I had some fun, and for two hours, I, I can say that I had some of the best times in the game that I've ever had. And when I left that day, I was just under 400k. Worked my day, and came out of work, was a little bit riled up, sat down, watched some TV, had a beer, had a vodka and cranberry, and let the frustrations of my day melt away. And then I jumped in the game for a little bit over an hour. And all I did for that hour was I left um, where I had parked, which was MICL1, grabbed my Vanguard, and went out towards Jericho Station. The mission wasn't up, so I went out and did a claim jumper mission, cleared the claim jumper and made some money. And then the Xenothreat mission appeared. I went, I uh, covered, I flew cap for people that were picking up all the resources that they have to at the wreck, and then the Xenothreat jumps in. Well, not by us, but by Jericho, which is like 600 kilometers away. I jumped back just in time to see the 20 people that have been camping the spot where it comes in blow the ship to pieces. I mean, they didn't really blow it up. It jumped out before they could kill it, but all you saw were all these torpedoes getting blown out of the sky and being, you know, impacting against the side of the Idris. And when the Idris takes enough damage, it jumps out. I went back to the wreck site and flew cap for a little bit, blew up a couple of Valkyries, blew up a Constellation, which was a hard, hard, hard ship to blow up. AI has gotten so much better, but combat has gotten better too. Well, I've gotten better at combat because now I have brand new TPR rudder pedals from none other than Thrustmaster, and I've learned how to kind of make my joystick and throttle work like two joysticks, which is pretty cool. I, I can't exactly say how I did it, but let's just put it this way. There's enough buttons, sliders, and, and rockers on that throttle to do whatever you want to do. So I like the way I'm flying right now. Pretty cool, pretty fun, and I had a blast. So second Idris comes in, not nearly half as many people were there. I got a chance to go and blow the Gladiuses out of the sky and the other support ships with a couple of other vanguards that were there. While the Eclipses, which don't carry a lot, I don't know why they went, and they're not very good at dogfighting unless you're really good at that, I don't know. But a couple of Eclipses and four Retaliator bombers took on the actual Idris. And by the time we had cleared cleared all of the debris, I'm going to call it debris because it's just cannon fodder, we were able to turn our attention on the Idris for the last 5 or 6% of the damage, and I launched my three size 5 torpedoes or missiles or whatever they call them over at the Idris, which promptly took out two of them but allowed one to impact on its side, which initiated its, this is all I got to do in the second run, which initiated its prompt retreat from the area. So I really wanted the satisfaction of seeing the Idris go boom, we didn't have it, or the satisfaction of seeing us lose and the Javelin go boom, we didn't see that. 
But at the end of the day, winding up at just shy of 500k at the end of that mission, I don't know how I got so much cash just from flying back and forth, blowing up a couple of ships and covering other people that were doing all the work. But holy cow, were the payouts from that mission wonderful. And it was fun. And although I wasn't playing with my own org or with anybody at that point, I was just trying to be incognito. Yes, Batgirl being incognito, telling everybody in chat, Batgirl's on the scene, flying cap, and everyone saying Batgirl who? And that's when I realized I suck. <laughs> I'm sorry for being gone so long, folks, but, you know, everybody has their reasons, and I can go over mine, but that would be excuses, and all you need to see is action from me. So, I'm back. I like it. The game is fun. And I have to say that it was buttery smooth. Performance, I don't know what they did, but performance in this game has been greatly uplifted. And I should knock wood right now because I didn't 30k once. I had a great time. So although you're not seeing any of the wonderful things that I did in the Xeno Threat missions, because reasons, you are seeing what I did to get back into the game, which was to jump into my favorite ship. I know I say that a lot. A girl's got to have her favorite, and this girl likes them all. That's just the way it is. But the Mercury Star Runner... Can, can you say anything bad about this ship? So to get back into the game, I just took the Star Runner, I flew it around to the different Lagrange points that I wanted to see, I wanted to see the updates they did, and then I flew it to my favorite place in the whole world, which is Microtech. And it, it just let me feel better. It just let me feel better about the game because I didn't have those hiccups. I didn't have those slowdowns. I didn't have those jerky movements that you get. I didn't get stuck in a seat. I didn't get thrown out an airlock. I didn't fall out the back of my ship. I didn't fall through the world. My person actually spawned in the room, not somewhere floating in space. And when I walked through... Uh, I usually just start off at Lorville whenever I start a new patch because I like to go from Lorville and leave the hellaciousness and disgustingness of Lorville and go to Microtech, which is cold and it, it, it in itself is a nightmare of a planet because it is a terraforming accident. But I go to Microtech where I can see green trees and beauty and snow-capped mountains and just practically die from the cold but still see beautiful scenes. And I, I got that feeling again. And I can't say it's the same feeling I got from that early, early, early days of 2013, which was actually the later days of 2013. It was September. But I did get a good feeling. And I'm just all over the game again. And I hope you join me as I put out more of these. Because these heartfelt videos that I'm doing about the game are really my, they're my true thoughts. I am salty. There are so many things that I still don't understand about the game. And I do have access to ask the questions. I just don't want to because I don't want to offend. But I, I, I still think that collectively this is the best game for sp the best space sim right now. And I know there's people that are going to say Elite Dangerous has all this stuff in it. I wouldn't fault Elite Dangerous for anything. I think it's a wonderful game. And I don't think it's the best, but I do think it is tip-top and excellent in every respect because in my world, this is what I want. And in Elite Dangerous, I've done this where I flew to planets and just got out of my ship and, it, and you can't walk around. You can soon, but you couldn't walk around. I got into that little scarab little thing and drove around the moons and planets without atmosphere and got some really nice looks but honestly when you think about this game and elite does this too so i'm not gonna fault them for not doing it but when you get into this game i think that there's too many people that don't realize the true wonder of star citizen and that's every planet every moon every star system you could fly around 
and spend your whole life trying to touch every square inch of every planet and every moon. If you see something in the distance, you could walk to it. It's just amazing. It's just amazing. Yeah, I'm sold. I think uh, 3.12.1 has done it for me. And I long to see 3.13 and the release of the Hercules. I can't wait to see the Tonk, the Nova Tank. And I really can't see, wait to see. I hope that wasn't a Freudian slip and they don't bring it out. And I do hope they do bring it out. I hope to see my Polaris by the end of the year. I hope to. I really expect it Q1, Q2 of next year, but I hope and pray that it's a very, very good Christmas present. Now look at this. This is so beautiful, isn't it? This is a great way to end this video. Folks, thank you so much for listening. These are my thoughts on Star Citizen. I'll be taking a look at the roadmap and calling out some of the biggest things that I see in it over the next few days. I'll put that video out probably by Wednesday. If you like this video, please click the thumbs up button below. And if you are a subscriber, please remember to click the notification bell icon so you get notified of all my future videos. With that said, folks, you all be safe out there, and I will talk to you soon.